Welcome back. Thanks for joining me. And I wanted to welcome you to the next episode on our YouTube channel for healthcare. I got a lot of questions on whether or not people should take the vaccine, how it works, and exactly what the pertinent issues are. As you know, the pandemic has raged since March, and it's changed the very life which most of us knew into something altogether different, where you work from home, you isolate, and you live in a way which is uh, dramatically different. The question is, when is it going to end? And so I want to get into some of that. But the most interesting part of it is that we now are on the beginning of the end. And there's been two vaccines in particular uh, from Pfizer-BioNTech and from uh, Moderna, which are mRNA uh, vaccines. This is a very interesting technology in that not in the history of the world have we had a, a pertinent uh, vaccine which has used the body's mRNA to fight uh, against a disease and immunize the body. And so let's talk about that a little bit. And then let's all t talk about what other options there are. So as we know, in March, the lockdown in India started. And it lifted after three months, and we sort of normalized, but we still have vast precautions. The hope is with these vaccines that we will immunize the population both in India and around the world to the point where we have something called herd immunity, where enough people have it that the virus won't be able to have any more candidates to spread. As you know, any disease process has to have a combination of a host and a disease and either the host passes on, in which case the disease won't take there. And that was partly the case with bubonic plague to some degree. But uh, the alternative is that you immunize people and you create an immunity to the disease where you don't have a host which is vulnerable. And so immunizations and vaccinations are nothing new. They've been used for over a hundred years on various types of diseases. In the past, though, they've taken anywhere between 10 and 20 years, at quickest sometimes six months to a year if you already had a vehicle. For instance, in the case of H1N1, where they piggybacked on previously existing vaccines for the flu. But now is different because you have a novel coronavirus, which has theoretically never been seen by the human race. As a result, a new vaccine had to be created within a very short period of time. We now have technologies like CRISPR, which can s slice out segments of DNA and RNA uh, individually and very precisely to the point, and then using other types of technologies to amplify that, create copies of that. And so what they've done then is to take a small portion of the virus, which in this case, the virus is an mRNA. So the interesting part now is that this particular virus is not a DNA-based virus. Instead, it's a portion of mRNA, which then gets taken into the body in, and then uptaken into the cells, which then use the, the machinery in the cells to replicate the virus. So viruses are an interesting thing, just like bacteria. They have one purpose, and that's to replicate, and in doing that, to proliferate and survive. And our body's immune system normally has a response using different types of cells, B cells and T cells, which create an immunologic memory. In this case, we don't have that memory, and so we have to create it from scratch. So when you get infected with this virus, so, uh, providing you survive, Theoretically, you should develop a T cell memory that will then amplify and become an uh, immune response to that virus if you get exposed to it again. We don't know for sure, though, because there have been reports of second cases or whatnot. In the case of these mRNA viruses, they're very novel in that what they do is they take the mRNA, uh, the messenger uh, ribonucleic acid, for the spike proteins, which are on the actual uh, capsule of the virus, and they define it from self versus non-self for the human body. 
And then the mRNA just for that spike protein is put into a lipid vacuole, which is something which the body can easily uptake. And then that mRNA is transcribed into more spike uh, proteins, which the body sees, but without the rest of the virus. So the other type of, we'll, we'll get to it in a second, but the other type of vaccines that are created are from either uh, attenuated or basically devitalized dead viruses, uh, which are DNA, or from uh, viruses which are alive, but they're attenuated, meaning they're less strong. This isn't that. This is, they take a portion of the mRNA, they put it in a uh, liposomal coat, and then the body takes it in and starts producing those spike protein, which then is recognized by the body's own machinery as foreign, and you develop an immune response for the spike proteins. When that happens, the body basically knows that this is a foreign body, and then when the actual virus comes into contact with the person, the body cells, both the T cells and the B cells, can attack viruses in turn, and you can get the necessary immunologic response to fight off the virus so it can implant and cause harm. And so the current viruses are interesting in that they have a far better efficacy or uh, ability to uh, vaccinate against the disease than anything we've ever seen. So this is an interesting concept, right? Think about this, that you can't expose the patients to the disease. That would be unethical. Instead, what happens is in the case of, for instance, the Pfizer vaccine, they uh, had 46,000 people, half of whom got a placebo, which is not the actual vaccine, and half got the vaccine. And then they looked at what was the incidence of people getting COVID in all of the population of 46,000 people. And what they said is that once 180 people got the disease, they would see exactly how many of those were in the placebo portion and how many were in the vaccine portion. And what they found was that 95% of the patients who got COVID-19 or were positive for COVID-19 were actually in the placebo arm of the study which said to them that this vaccine is incredibly powerful and it's very, very effective at preventing patients from getting COVID-19. There's some interesting takeaways from this. In similar fashion, the Moderna vaccine was tested and had some of the same results. Now, there are a couple of differences between the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna. The Pfizer needs to be at a very cold temperature, negative 80 degrees below zero. And so it is somewhat difficult to uh, transport, and they have devised these basically flying refrigerators, if you will, which take the vaccine there. I see that as a problem in the Indian subcontinent because for obvious reasons, we live in a very hot country. The Moderna vaccine by comparison has to be at negative four degrees, so it's a little better to transport. But there's one other option, which is the Oxford vaccine, which I haven't talked about, and that is actually based on more traditional technology with a attenuated or uh, silenced vaccine, which just shows the body the vaccine and allows it to create an immune response. In that study, they found about 70 to 72 percent of the patients had a immunologic um, response um, and were prevented from having COVID when you looked at both the placebo and the uh, treated arms. But the only issue was that in the cases where half of the first dose was given, these patients had a better response, greater than 90% uh, efficacy or, or uh, safety from getting the actual uh, disease. The only problem with that is that was partly uh, fault of manufacturing and that they only gave out half doses to 2,300 uh, patients without knowing it. So now they're testing it, trying to get the approvals. We'd still think even with the other arm that it was greater than 60% uh, efficacy, which meets the standards for a vaccine. Um, the second thing is the temp freezer uh, requirements are probably less in the case of the Os Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. 
Now, there are other, are other vaccines which are indigenously made in India, and we've looked at a lot of them which are just finishing up phase two studies and moving on to phase three, but we don't have the results of those yet. The results are promising, um, but they are, it would be premature to say that they're 100% successful and that we can start using it. But I think <coughs> some of these vaccines, in particular the AstraZeneca and Oxford, as well as the Pfizer and the Moderna, will get approvals in India. Now here's the next question everyone's asking me. Should I take this vaccine? Well, I don't think we really have a choice if you think about it. The first thing is, if you're worried about side effects, by the time there's enough vaccine dosages produced, it will be probably first quarter of next year, 2021, um, to about June of next year. Now, if you think about that practically, by then we should know all of the risks and complications. And so I don't think there'll be an issue there. The second thing is that if you think about this, it's not about the issue of you not getting sick, getting hospitalized, or potentially dying. You should not think about yourself in this. The risk is that in not getting everyone vaccinated, that we potentially perpetuate the disease. Remember what I said about hosts and disease? Well, if all the hosts are vaccinated, there's no longer a potential for that disease to have someone who's vulnerable to it. And so in order for a vaccine to be most successful, you need to wipe out the possibility of that disease ever implanting in the patients. So in my opinion, I would stand in line once the safety studies are approved and that we have good evidence. But I would say to you that it's, it's not only your honor, but your duty to get it done. You may disagree with me, and I'd love to hear it in the comments below. I know you guys are worried about it, but look, this is not a tenable situation. We can't live like this, and we can't let this disease live to influence how we act. It's, it's really having a very, very huge effect on many different uh, sectors, and most of all on individuals, and the death toll is mounting. So we definitely need to intervene, and now we do have something which is effective at treating it um, from a vaccine and immunization and prevention standpoint. So I don't think there's any doubt in my mind what I would do. The decision has to be yours though, ultimately. I've kind of educated to you to the facts. I've also provided a very nice link to vaccines in general, which kind of teaches you about the ABCs. <laughs> and I haven't covered them, so you'll forgive me. But I, I think what we've tried to do with this video and my other videos is to start a dialogue and to get you thinking about the right things and to give you some of our opinions based on evidence which is at the highest levels. Look, I'm having a hard time with the fact that most of the people are getting scared by headlines, which are from preprint servers with no backing. What I'd rather do is sit down and have an intelligent conversation with you guys and bring you the best in terms of data and experts and other things, as I've always said. So I hope this helps you. As always, if you like it, hit the like button. If you want to see more of the videos, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so you can be notified. 